was like an incredible great exchange where we can come and bring to Jesus those things that upset us and hurt us and the things that we've done to upset and hurt other people we can give them to him and as an exchange that he will give us God's love and new life and a renewed friendship with God. I've hurt someone. I've done things wrong. I hate it. They lied to me. I lied. I feel so alone. I cheated. I've made a mess of things. I don't feel well. I stole something. I wounded my mum. They left me out. I swore! I lost my friend. Thanks for joining us. This is Nantwich Elam Church. I'm Pastor Michelle and I'm so pleased you could join us today. Um, this is our service for Sunday the 18th of April and uh, you may have noticed there's a bit of dust in the air. We have been cleaning the chapel here 
some the team have been up in the rafters like right 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 up to the very top of the church and been cleaning and bringing some of the dust down that we think might have been there for the last 97 years or so that the building's been built so welcome welcome you know today our service is taking place outside our main service is happening in the grounds of our church on the london road so regent's um, park on the London Road, Nantwich. Um, you can find us there at 11 o'clock um, and uh, we will be having a great time together. We will be outside in the fresh air, enjoying the sunshine on a warm April's day, um, wearing our masks and singing very loud, I hope, and uh, really enjoying gathering together. But if you can't be with us today, if you can't be there, at 11 o'clock we just put together this little service um, for you so enjoy our time of praying together our time of worshiping together and a short message as well and uh, we will be back online next week but also we'll, we're planning to meet in the chapel as well when the dust has settled and we can breathe freely um, we will be meeting and gathering back in the building as well so come along if you can there'll be the 9 30 service and the 11 o'clock service but uh, today you're online with us so in a moment there'll be some songs of worship some prayer um, There'll be a short message, but first I'm going to pray. So thank you for being with us today. Father God, we come before you and thank you that you are the one true living God. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we worship you today. We give you glory and honour and praise. And we ask, Lord God, um, that we would know you more deeply as we gather together, that we'd be strengthened as we pray, as we worship and we hear your word together we pray for those who don't believe yet in our families in our workplaces in our community lord we ask that your word would go forth in power and people would receive jesus as their savior their healer their baptizer and their coming king and father however our hearts are today whatever the condition of our hearts father we pray we would be strengthened by meeting with you Father God, we ask, Lord God, if we are weeping right now, if we are in loss, that your spirit would come and bless us as we mourn. And Father, if we find ourselves in a time of, of flourishing and prosperity, then Lord God, we pray that you would help us to keep near to you in the enjoyment of that season, Lord. Let us not depart from loving you or get complacent in our worship, but let us draw close to you. So however we are today, Father, we pray we would draw nearer to you, be strengthened by you. We'd know the filling of your spirit so that we could go out into the world you've created and share the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to be the gospel. In Jesus' name, we come to you today. Strengthen us, Lord. Amen. Morning, babe, this darkness seems to have no dawn. I'm hanging by a thread, the fabric of my faith is torn. And I'm holding on to you. I'm holding. But it's closing in Pain seems to hide you from my view I need to hear your voice I need you, Lord, I need a breakthrough I'm holding on to you Praise you, you still got 
summarize I choose to set my sights on you And when my vision clears I'll see the mountains that you move God, you were holding on to me I read these verses from the Bible. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God and as we think of giving there are all sorts of things that motivate us to give to God's work there's obviously the biblical principle of tithing and giving there's obviously the principle of rejoicing in seeing the work of God extended in Nantwich and in the surrounding area. But for me, the thing that motivates us the greatest to give is when we think of the immense generosity of God to us in Christ Jesus as revealed by God his spirit we know that fullness of God in our lives 
And out of that fullness, it motivates us in a worshipful sense to give back to this generous God and Father of ours.
light in this moment Reassure us of your word Your promises are true We need you Hello, and welcome to this time together when we're going to explore a rather unusual story that's only recorded in the Gospel of Mark. In fact, it's unique in the Gospels, especially because Jesus doesn't. Well, we'll get to that later. My name's Keith Warrington, and I'd like to take you back a few years. We were on a family holiday in Orlando, Florida where the Disney parks are located, plus an assortment of water parks. Now, these water parks are vast areas of entertainment, all involving water. And one of the experiences available is a tall water slide with a 30 meter vertical drop, the base of which curves into a shallow receiving pool. And our young son, Luke, who was about 10, was intrigued and I rashly volunteered to join him. Now that involved joining crowds of people who were engaged in a steep climb up steps to a platform in the sky that accommodated a number of lifeguards. And they supervised two queues of mainly young people and directed them towards two gates that would plunge them into a dark downwards abyss. Now at this point, my brain shouted, go back. But my embarrassment at the thought of trying to descend the steps through the ascending crowds of excited pleasure seekers, well, that overcame my common sense. Those who were to undertake the experience of our lives, so we were told, we sat in front of the gates, we crossed our arms across our chests and we crossed our ankles. And at a word from the lifeguard, We shuffled to the edge of the slide where our legs dangled over the vertical drop. At that point, it was too late to go back. I was no longer in control of my destiny. The people waiting behind me were in control. And with Luke on the adjacent slide, I had no option but to launch off into the unknown. And with my life flashing before my eyes and my heart beating far too quickly for my age, I did. And I survived. Though I still carry the memory 30 years on. But being out of control, that's what it does. It makes us vulnerable and it can cause us fear and a sense of panic. It's not a very nice experience. And yet it happens to us all the time. Circumstances change. Life throws something at us unexpectedly. And it's scary because not only do we feel as if we're not in control of our lives, but sometimes it feels as if no one else is. Not even God. But he is. He is in charge. And this morning we're going to explore one of the strangest events in the life of Jesus to affirm this truth. This story is about a man who has a problem that makes his life a misery because he lives in a world of darkness. And because of that, he's very uncertain of life. He can see nothing. He can see no one. He doesn't know where he's going or what's ahead. Everything is dark because he's blind. And because of that, he's vulnerable. He's not in charge of his life. And then he meets Jesus and his problem gets solved. But I'm more interested in the message that Mark wants us to learn. You see, his message is much more important than that Jesus can heal blindness. Of course he can. But there's something more important than this. And Mark uses this story to illustrate this truth. And it's a truth that's perfect for those times 
when our world seems confusing and we feel as if we're in a fog, when the present, let alone the future, is unclear and even scary. So let's read the story. It's in Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to Jesus a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he'd spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, Jesus asked him, do you see anything? And the man looked up and said, well, I see men, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on him again and he opened his eyes. And this time his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Now, Mark's writing his gospel to Christians who are living in the largest city in the empire, Rome. And it's a city of huge contrasts with a few extremely rich people and the majority who are slaves or rely on others for their food. They're poor. And the Christians come from the majority poor. And on top of that, they're beginning to be persecuted. And much of this occurs because of the emperor Nero. You see, during his reign, a great fire occurred in the city that decimated it and killed thousands of Roman citizens and others. And in order to deflect suspicion from himself as the one who caused the fire, he blames the Christians. And even though many Romans didn't believe this accusation, Christians were accused of starting the fire and were themselves burned to death or crucified. And it was a frightening time of loneliness and living in the shadows. Like the blind man, it was a time of darkness and fear, a time of uncertainty, a time of not knowing which way to go and who was in charge. Mark's got a very important message for his readers, and this is it. Someone else knows where they're going, and he's able to provide the light, but not necessarily straight away. Of course, that's Jesus. But there'll be times this week when life gangs up on us, and we also won't know which way to turn. There'll be times in our lives when we've choices to make and we're not sure what we should do and we're afraid of making a mistake. And we're like the blind man and the Roman Christians who were in the dark and we need someone to walk with us as they did. And the message of Mark to us is the same as to his readers. Jesus is in the darkness with us and in his time he'll provide the light. So what happens to the blind man? Well, the first thing we read is that the people beg Jesus to touch him. And Jesus takes the man's hand and leads him out of the village. Interesting. Why? Well, Jesus is giving the blind man the opportunity to trust him. Even though he can't see Jesus and so he doesn't know where Jesus is leading him, he's prepared to take his hand and trust him in his darkness. And Mark wants us to determine whether we are prepared to trust Jesus in our darkness too. But then Jesus spits on the man's eyes. That's strange. And why does he do it? Well, the Jews believed that spittle had therapeutic powers. In fact, they believed that the spittle of a rabbi had special therapeutic powers. You see, spittle was associated with therapy. And so Jesus is demonstrating to this man who can't see him that something therapeutic is going to happen, something good. And so when he feels the gentle spray of liquid touching his eyes, he's aware of what that signifies. Something good is going to happen to him. Now, Jesus didn't need to do this. He could have just healed him, but he wants to lead the man to his healing in a gentle way that helps him know the journey ahead. He's safe because Jesus is in charge of that journey and he's there to do him good. And then Jesus lays his hands on him. 
Why? Well, you see, for the Jewish people, touch was very significant. And in the healing ministry of Jesus, it was also very important. And I'll tell you why. You see, nearly everybody in the country thought that people who were ill had sinned and that God had punished them with illness because of their sins. No, it wasn't true, but it was what they believed. And because of that, those people were thought to be ceremonially unclean. And if you touched that ill person, you also were ceremonially unclean. But the Gospels record that Jesus often touched people who were ill. And it wasn't specifically to show compassion, as it might be in our culture. Rather, it was to say, in effect, Jesus doesn't get contaminated by their illness. It's as if Jesus is saying, you don't transfer anything negative to me when I touch you, but I transfer something positive to you when I touch you. Touch, the symbol of his authority. But now it gets very strange because Jesus asked the man if he could see. And the man said that he could, but it wasn't perfect. His sight was blurred. Now, this is the only time that Jesus didn't heal someone completely and very quickly. So Jesus lays his hands on the man's eyes again, and this time he's completely healed. And the story's finished. But what's the message? What's the lesson? In particular, why did Jesus have to have another go at healing the man? Why wasn't the healing immediate, as happened on other occasions when he healed blind people? Well, maybe this was a particularly difficult case of blindness. After all, there's no record of any blind person in the Old Testament getting healed. And the rabbi stated that healing a blind person is as hard as raising somebody from the dead, meaning it's impossible. But there's no evidence that this was a particularly complicated blindness. And anyway, three chapters earlier, Jesus raised a little girl from the dead. Surely if he could raise someone from the dead, he could heal blindness. So why does Jesus take two attempts to heal a man? And why does Mark tell us? Now, this is where the story gets very interesting. You see, although here... Only one man needed to be helped to see physically. Jesus knew that many more people, including you and me, we need to be helped in those times when all we can initially see is darkness, though we may see more clearly in the future. That's the message. So let's enjoy the way that Mark relates it to his readers. And let's see the whole story. Because before this healing story of a blind man, Mark tells a story of Jesus feeding 4,000 people with a little bit of bread and fish. Jesus doesn't need bread. He can manufacture it miraculously. Now, he then gets into a boat with his disciples and he warns them about those who oppose him. And he says, they are like the yeast that permeates dough to make bread. Jesus says that his followers have to watch out for those people who will permeate their community and do them harm. But the disciples misunderstand and they think that Jesus is telling them off because they haven't brought any bread for the journey. For goodness sake, he's just fed thousands of people supernaturally with plenty of bread. He doesn't need their bread. Ah, but they've missed the point. They've quickly forgotten Jesus's power. They saw it then, but now they've forgotten it. And Jesus says to them, you don't understand, do you? You don't see who I am. You did see my miraculous power, but now you've forgotten. Their sight has let them down. Now, it's then that Mark records the story of Jesus healing the blind man. Initially, And then completely. After this story, Jesus has another chat with his disciples. And this time he says to them, who do you think I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. Do you see what's happening? Peter accurately sees who Jesus is. But then Jesus tells them he's going to die. And Peter says, no, you're not. This time Peter's got it wrong. 
Peter doesn't understand. He doesn't fully see who Jesus is. He doesn't realize that Jesus has to die. First, he doesn't see accurately. Then he does. Then he doesn't. And life's a bit like that sometimes. You see, this story of the blind man seeing is in a section where the lesson is not about healing. It's all about seeing, about being in the dark, about living with uncertainty, about knowing and not knowing, about seeing and not seeing and then seeing, about learning to trust the one who sees everything that happens to us. So, Mark, what are you trying to tell us? Well, it's this. Peter didn't always get it right. He didn't fully understand straight away. First, Peter didn't see clearly. He misunderstood Jesus. And then he did see clearly, but then he didn't. But in effect, Jesus says, that's okay, because I'm in charge of your life. Just as he was in charge of the destiny of the blind man, who didn't see clearly, first of all, but then he did. Now, the Christians in Rome are like the blind man. They have partial sight initially because they know Jesus is their saviour, but they don't know what to do now because darkness has fallen on them and they feel vulnerable and fearful because of the persecution. And their fear blocks out light and banishes hope. They're in the dark as far as their circumstances are concerned and they worry about the future and what they should do. Jesus says, it's okay, I can see, I'm in charge. And so this week, when things will happen to us and uncertainty will descend on us and we'll be troubled as to which way we should turn, the message of the story is also valuable. Because, in effect, this is not unusual for the Christian. It happened to Peter. He was in the dark. But like the blind man, complete sight was granted by Jesus. Full restoration did occur. But, and here's the point, not straight away. And it's the same for us. Following Jesus means that sometimes the journey will be obscured by shadows caused by sadness or heartache and fear. And we'll wonder what we should do. Remember Peter. That was him. Remember the blind man? That was him. Jesus took that man by the hand and took over his journey and said, trust me. And then he ensured that he could see at the right time. And the message to us, stay with Jesus and trust him to enable us to see in his time. And in the meantime, we rely on him to hold our hand until it's the right time to see more clearly. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you took the initiative with that blind man and with Peter. Thank you that you have taken the decision to take care of us. And we do want to trust you more, knowing that when the time is right, you'll let us see more clearly. And in the meantime, Help us to know that you first hold our hand. Help us to enjoy what that means. We're safe. Thank you. Amen. And until we meet again, may you increasingly know the God who's in charge of you, holding your hand when you can't see and even when you can. Goodbye. you found me you've stolen my heart you've stolen my heart you found me awakened my heart awakened my heart Sinking sand, you're the rock on which 
I stand You're the rock on which I stand And in the pain and suffering You are stretching out your hand You are stretching out your hand To me
Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, as normal, I am going to close our service with our church blessing. We bless this church with the blessings of God so it can be the church the Lord has called it to be. We bless this church with an increase in knowing the presence of God. We bless this church with release and renewal in the Holy Spirit. We bless this church with a newfound love and liberty in Jesus Christ. We bless this church with God's protection. We bless this church with a new power to share the good news in this community, the nation and the nations. We bless this church in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, thank you for joining us. You be blessed today and we look forward to connecting with you throughout the week. Um, do email us or send us your prayers, prayer at namwichelimchurch.org. We'd be happy to pray for you and um, keep on trusting the Lord. See you soon.